Sorry, I don't love you. A friends have grown accustomed to. Cause with you, if something isn't wrong, something isn't wrong, something isn't right. I wish you could be happy. Hey everyone, welcome to Geekdom is Back. We have another comics-related episode for you this week. I have on Max Mallet. We are going to talk about Batman The Long Halloween. It's quite a thick comic book trade, so if you haven't read it, you should definitely do that because there will be spoilers. But Max, how are you doing today? Doing all right. How are you, Dana? Pretty good. Excited for this podcast. I know you and I went back and forth on Twitter a bit about it, and we both really enjoy this comic so much that I think, you know, we both have quite a bit to say about it. But first things first, the creative team is Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale, and they did quite a few comics together. You know, before this, they did Batman Haunted Night, which I believe was a few single issues based around Halloween that were then put together in that Haunted Night trade. And they did Dark Victory after this, which I have not read both of those yet, but I own them, so I have to get to them. And I believe they also did Catwoman When in Rome, which ran concurrently with Dark Victory. So Max, have you read any of those other three, or is The Long Halloween sort of the one thing of theirs that you've checked out so far? So uh, I'm aware of all of those. Uh, The first Loeb and Sale production that I read was Batman Hush. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, it was um, it wasn't Sale. It was Jim Lee on Hush. Right, uh, right. But Hush was where I first discovered Loeb and uh, how great of a writer he is. But yes, uh, Batman: The Long Halloween is the first Loeb Sale uh, tag team that I, I I read. Although they've also done a number of Marvel works as well. Okay, uh, yeah. They, uh, Hulk, Gray, Daredevil, Yellow. I believe Spider Man Blue, and maybe Captain America White. So they've done quite a bit. Yeah, I think they did most or all of that color series, basically, that Marvel did. I have read one or two of those, but I didn't really dive in. Or I don't think at the time I even realized it was this same creative team. But basically, the premise behind The Long Halloween is we have this sort of a different bad guy for once you know it's not all about the joker or the typical batman villains this is about one that they have named holiday and they at first think it's the calendar man because all of these killings and all the crimes keeps happening on these big holidays so naturally you know they're going to think it's calendar man at first but they dub him or her holiday. We, we'll, we will get to that part. But what did you think of the idea of this comic and sort of the format of it with doing each issue as a different holiday? I think it's brilliant um, in a, a few different ways. Um, it's the sort of impending chaos that right. comes along with the Joker that you know rattles Batman and rattles Gotham. However, uh, it's more organized than he is. Yeah. And because someone else is in the spotlight, this is going to step on not just Batman's toes, but also the Joker's. And obviously, this steps on the calendar man's toes. Because yes. doing, doing things based on dates is, is really his, uh, his shtick. So I think that is brilliant. Just the notion that something is coming and you can't stop it, even if you're Batman. Right. I, I think it's very... It's very fresh. I don't know how else to put it, but um, I I enjoyed every page of it. I, I read the second half of the trade in one evening, so I could not put it down. It took me, I believe, two or three sittings to get through it. That that was mostly by choice because I've been really getting into Batman stories ever since I started reading Snyder and Capullo's Batman. So I've been going back, finding some of the older you know, the really big stories about Batman. And of course, this is one of the most well-known Batman stories. And 
I kind of wanted to sort of savor the comic, even though I own it and I could go back to it anytime I want. I've never really been a person who rereads something just because I feel like there are so many new things I could be reading. It's hard for me to justify going back and rereading something just for the sake of rereading it. So I do still have, you know, like I mentioned, Haunted Night, Dark Victory on my shelf to check out. So I will still get some more lobe and sale in my life. It just probably won't be revisiting The Long Halloween except for, you know, this podcast. And I read it fairly recently, so I don't need too much of a refresher. I do just, you know, over here I have the Wikipedia page up so I don't get my facts wrong because, as we all know, Wikipedia is always truthful. I'm saying that with the, as much sarcasm as I possibly can right now. <laughs> oh, the, the, as everyone knows, the internet is never wrong. Never. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I think, you know, like you said, this is a great format for this comic. And, you know, obviously dubbing the killer holiday is the obvious choice. And, you know, even though it sort of focuses all around holiday, we still get Harvey Dent becoming Two-Face. We still get, you know, appearances from Catwoman, Carmine Falcone, even the Joker. And it's sort of, you know, almost like a who's who of the Batman criminals and villains and everything. And I think Jeff Loeb did such a great job incorporating all of these characters into the story while not making it solely about them. Exactly. Of the rogues that we are introduced to in this book, who are rogues for the entire book, I think it's fair to say Catwoman is the one that gets the most shine. Right. Yeah, I definitely agree with that because, you know, her and Batman tend to be going after the same people, but for different reasons. Mm -hmm. So I think that is something that really comes through in this comic book. And while, you know, she's not against what Batman is doing. It's like she sort of has her own motive for it. So it kind of brings about this interesting relationship between not only Bruce and Selina, but Batman and Catwoman as their, you know, alter egos there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So obviously this comic, it originally was published in 96 and 97. So it's, you know, 20 years old, basically. What do you think about the fact that this is still one of, you know, the must-read Batman stories? I know, you know, not everyone is going to like every single iteration of Batman, but this one seems to always be one that is on people's lists of if you are going to read Batman comics, you need to read, you know, The Dark Knight Rises, The Long Halloween, and I think even at this point, you know, a lot of people will say that about Snyder and Capullo's Batman, But what do you think about it, you know, being 20 years old now, for the most part, obviously, some issues published in 97, not quite 20 years old, but as a whole, the general idea of this comic and everything is 20 years old. So do you think, you know, this one will continue to stand that test of time? I hope it does. Uh, I've been trying to wrap my head around which is my favorite Batman trade or graphic novel. Um. This is a contender. Right. And here's the thing about this this graphic novel. It feels a little bit dated, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Right. I also I also think The Dark Knight Returns feels a bit dated, but it's, it's so stylistically interesting. Yeah. Um, I love what Greg, Greg Capullo has done with, with Batman, with what he did in the New 52. Um with that said, there's some uh, Green Lantern comics during that same era where the art is similar. And that's not a knock. It's simply saying that Tim Sale's artistic style here physically is just, it's unique. It's yeah. like his own thumbprint. And I, I think, I hope it survives for that reason because it's hyper stylized. Uh, if you look at the front cover, to me, Batman's cape looks like Spawn's cape. I, and it, granted, it's, it's obviously not the same. But right. What I mean by that is it's a massive cape and it makes him look like a demon. And I, I think it's just very imposing. It's unique. 
uh, Loeb's, and then going away from the art for a second, Loeb's writing is astonishing. Um, what I appreciate so much about it is it's kind of the opposite of a Michael Bay movie. Michael Bay movie is all sizzle, no steak. <laughs> and this, this is the action supplements the storyline. And I think that's, that's missing from a lot of comic books, from movies, from a lot of TV shows. Uh, and I think that the formula here gets it right, where it's, you know, maybe 70% story, 30% action. And that's the kind of balance I like. I appreciate the char- the character building. There are some genuine tender moments where Bruce Wayne is more than just this sullen, emotionless husk of a character. Right. I really appreciate that about what, what Loeb and Sale have done. Yeah, and I definitely have a lot of the same things to say about it, but what really got me is, you know, 20 years later, I started reading this trade and it, like you said earlier, I didn't want to put it down. I mean, I sort of forced myself to just so I didn't read it all in one sitting and just have it be over with already. I kind of, like I said, wanted to savor it. And I think, you know, when you have stories like that where people just don't want to put them down, you definitely have something good going for you. And obviously, you know, I've heard various things about their other work together and mostly what i've been hearing is you know the long halloween is the best of those and while the others are good they might not be as good as this was and you know even you know back in 96 and 97 this comic was received very well especially you know critically even though you know it's more of a darker artistic style I guess you can say and I feel like with Batman it's like you sort of expect things to get dark just because you know it's Batman it's Gotham you know it's sort of this crime riddled city that people still try to find hope in and I think when you're doing Batman as opposed to Bruce Wayne it's always going to get a little dark and then Bruce Wayne is kind of there to bring light to certain situations especially when you know you have something like Batman the animated series that people loved because it did the two different sides of him so well and I think this comic does the same thing certainly so you mentioned trying to figure out what your favorite Batman comic was do you think this is probably high on the list for a lot of Batman fans? It's probably number one for a lot of them. Uh, it would be interesting if a a respected site or if, if a comic convention had a poll at some point. I would be very curious. Yeah. Because I don't know about you, but my short list is of the ones I've read. I haven't read all of them, but I've, I've read a huge chunk by this point. Long Halloween is in my top three. Right. I would also say that for me, so is Hush. And I think I'm going to have to go with Endgame. Okay. Uh, Court of Owls is, frankly, every single trade that Lou and Snyder have done is amazing. Right. I think Endgame tied so many loose ends together that were incredible. Yeah, and... You know, like you, I haven't read everything, but I've read quite a few of, you know, the big ones. I've read, obviously, The Long Halloween. I've read Killing Joke. I've read the first, I believe, eight trades out of ten of the Snyder and Capullo run. I've read Year One. I've read The Dark Knight Returns. So I kind of have those big ones covered, but I'm still wanting to go through and sort of sort through all of these different Batman stories and the different creative teams. Like, I haven't read anything of Grant Morrison's Batman, and I think that's oh, probably... It's, it's weird. Yeah, I think Real that's weird. probably the one I, I get the most mixed views on. But, you know, I have... Batman R.I.P. sitting on my shelf. So that I will get to at some point for sure. And I picked up, you know, one you recommended to me, Arkham Asylum by Grant Morrison. So I I definitely have my work cut out for me, but 
I think I agree of what I've read so far, even though I loved Snyder and Capullo's run. This is definitely up there for me, not necessarily just because, you know, it's Tim Sale and Jeff Loeb as a team on it. I think this story in particular, it was just so unique and it felt so different from sort of like what I knew about Batman and his villains and the the crime bosses and everything that it just kind of intrigued me from the start. Absolutely. Um, so I'm not as big of an art guy as a story guy. I don't know about you. Right. But I think on its own, I, I wouldn't necessarily know what to make of Tim Sale's art. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's it's quite good, but I, I don't have an eye for art the way that I do for narrative. With that said, uh, I think it works perfectly with Loeb's style of writing because this to me kind of feels like it's very 1930s with all the, the mafia yeah. and the sort of absurdity of the villains. There's a, a kind of great marriage of it, it's dark, but it's also fun. It's not uh, it's not so um, stylistically bleak that it turns you off like it's it definitely it hits you as the kids say you know right in the feels in certain <laughs> chapters uh but the art reminds you that it's a little whimsical the, the joker's smile is um inhuman it's like it's yeah but it's also there's something whimsical and, and somewhat childlike about it at times yeah i i definitely see where you're going with with that and I definitely have to agree. I've always been, I think, more of a story person. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that I didn't get into comics until, you know, the last year or two, really. So it's like, for me, I read, you know, all of the Harry Potter books and I grew up reading those and watching the movies. And it's like, you know, that is one kind of narrative. And I think the movies while they did an excellent job, they were sort of a different kind of thing. But when you have comics and you have the narrative and the visual all in one place, it's like sometimes one doesn't need to be just as good as the other. I feel like, like you said, you know, you're more of a story guy than an art guy. I think just the fact that we have the story and a visual all in the same place with comics you don't necessarily need the art to be exactly what you want it to be because if you're reading that story and the story is what grabs you, the art will be a nice addition, but it won't be everything to the story. 100%. I think also as someone who focuses on writing, whether it's you know comic book reviews, reviewing the CW TV shows and whatnot – as a someone who writes, it's like, obviously, you know, the writing might interest me more than the art because I can kind of appreciate any art because I can't do better than any of these comic book artists ever, even art that people, you know, seem to not like. It's like, well, I can't do better, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. So I feel like I'm a little more lenient when it comes to art. It's like, even if it isn't my thing, I can still recognize when it's well done and good art. And it's not that, you know, I didn't enjoy Tim Sale's art at all. I think, like you said, it fits really well with the book. It's just the story is what grabbed me more. And I think, you know, it really depends on the Batman story because with Snyder and Capullo, they're both so good at what they do that it was definitely the combination of the two there that grabbed me with them. Yes. Yes. I, I agree. Um, I will say that my personal taste is, uh, for, uh, for Pulo's style. Right. With, with that said, um, I, I think for me, if I enjoy the story, I'm more likely to enjoy the art because I associate it with the story. Yeah. I, I feel the same. Yeah. So I, I've been reading a few different comics lately that, uh, artistically are, they're they're mostly image or, or dark horse and they're very unlike the sort of DC house style or the Marvel house style that I'm used to. But because the art matches the story, 
I can forgive what I would otherwise not necessarily be a fan of if it were just a piece of art. Right. Yeah. So, you know, before we really wrap this up, I do want to get into spoilers a little bit. So here is your warning, everyone. I will also have it as a podcast chapter so you guys can either skip right to spoilers or just skip the spoilers altogether. It's up to you. But in this story, you know, at the end, we find out Gilda sort of started the holiday person and, you know, this identity. But we also find out that she didn't finish it. So it's like someone took over and she thinks it was Harvey, but she's not entirely sure. And she sort of just wants Harvey to get better. So what did you think about, you know, sort of that little twist there at the end? I think if anyone tells you that they knew what was coming, they're lying. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I did not see this coming at all. <laughs> I, I had a couple of theories along the way, and I appreciate that uh, Loeb takes you down the rabbit hole of the, those theories. Yeah, like, oh, it could be this guy. Oh, it could be this person. Oh, you never know, sort of thing. Yeah, it, it's it's as if it's as if Loeb is teasing the reader, which is what he's doing. But, but I, I appreciate that. Yeah. I did not see the twist coming. I'm a huge... I forgot that I was such a fan of mysteries. I haven't read one probably since I was a kid, to be honest. Right. I don't find a lot of mysteries in comics. Uh, at least not ones that are convincing. Like, for example, I, I love Batman Hush. Right. I think that the mystery in that book you can see coming a mile away. Okay. And in the long Halloween, good luck to you. You're, <laughs> you're not going to guess it. Yeah, and I feel like, you know, Batman is sort of the perfect character to go into these mysteries with, especially when you get in as deep as Jeff Loeb did with this story, because... You know, Batman is known as a detective, and what is a detective supposed to do? Solve mysteries, solve, you know, crimes, that sort of thing. And I feel like that aspect isn't necessarily used as much as you would like as far as the mystery aspect goes. Like, sure, Batman's always going to be stopping criminals, but when you have someone, you know, like the Joker or Two-Face, it's like, okay, these are these characters, this is what they do to Batman, you know, Snyder and Capullo were able to do a nice Joker story. But like you said, this one just had so much mystery to it and you had no clue who Holiday was pretty much until, I believe, that last issue. Correct. That's correct. Uh, you don't find out until the very end. Yeah, and I think that is something that it just really helps build up the story and you never really... I, hit a peak with this story, I would say, because I feel like the entire time Jeff Loeb is keeping you on your toes and you're like, okay, who is it? And as more holidays go by, it's like you still don't know who it is. So he's just sort of keeping everyone on their toes until the very, very last moment. And then even then you're like, oh, well, are we sure it was Harvey that took up the rest of the killings, you know? So he still sort of leaves that question in your mind for it. Yes. I just wanted to, you know, ask you, what was your, did you have a favorite issue or is it the story as a whole that really does it for you? It's actually not unrelated to the question that I have for you, but I'll, I'll let that burn for a little while. <laughs> I appreciated this whole story for so many reasons. Yeah. I had, I probably had two favorite issues. It's going to be hard for me to narrow it down. Okay. Uh, I'll start chronologically. Mother's Day. Okay. Yeah. That was Love a great Mother's one. Day. You don't see Bruce or Batman show a lot of emotion. Right. And uh, I read a good chunk of this book. Uh, with my girlfriend in the room who does not read comics uh, yet, anyway. <laughs> and I, she, she knows the basic story of Batman. I think almost everybody does. Right. And when I showed her the last splash page in the Mother's Day um, chapter with Bruce hugging his mom, he's under the Scarecrow's um, 
medicine, if you will. Right. So his fear is driving him to his mother's tombstone. It's hugging the tombstone. It says, uh, in loving memory, of Martha Wayne. And he's crying, and the police are descending on him. Uh, I want a, a painting of that, because that was as emotional of a Bruce Wayne scene as I can remember in any book. Yeah, definitely. And that was absolutely one of the issues or chapters, whatever you want to call them at this point, that stood out to me. And I I remember looking at that and I was like, wow, this is like so brutal to Bruce, but it doesn't get, you know, quite as dark as we've seen Batman stories get. It's sort of like there's a glimpse of hope in it even though you know we know he's under scarecrow spell so to speak and it's not actually happening it's just such a painful and touching moment all at the same time yes yes and it's almost colorless there's a yellow like the yellow moon is kind of blotted by the um, by clouds and there's a uh, yellow police light, presumably coming from a helicopter. Uh, that is not presumably; it is coming from a helicopter. That is, it somewhat illuminates Bruce, and it illuminates the whole tombstone. But the only real color is is this sort of uh, sterile yellow, and it's it's pretty haunting. Yeah, and I think you know, Tim Sale did a great job of sort of incorporating these holidays in a lot too because i believe it's the saint patrick's day issue where we get you know poison ivy so you kind of you really get that green theme going for you because you know obviously it's all about wearing green saint patrick's day whether or not you really do that or not is something different but i think the way they put together this book and sort of had these different holidays mean something different while keeping the story in place was really well done. Yes. And it's subtle too. It's not in your face. Yeah. I just, you know, when I was reading it, I was like, wow, they, they nailed this with the holidays and everything. And I was just so impressed with it that I was like, I don't know if I want to read Batman again for a little while. You know, I think after the long Halloween, I needed to take a little break from Bat Batman and go read about some other characters for a bit before I returned to it. Because, you know, I don't want to read another Batman story and just be like, well, this wasn't the long Halloween, so screw that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Read a, I don't know, read some Deadpool or, or someone who's like a polar opposite character. <laughs> right, and right. To it. <laughs> yeah. Do you have uh, a favorite part that you want to mention before I mention my other favorite moment? You know, I think it's really hard to pick just one. But what I really did like, even though, you know, this wasn't huge on featuring the Joker, but it's like the Joker was somewhat really disappointed that he wasn't the big bad guy that Batman yeah. was going after. And I think that that moment it was just like yes batman finally got to joker without even trying you know because joker's the one that's always playing mind games with him and bruce didn't even really have to do anything to kind of screw with joker's feelings and i thought that was a really nice moment and like you mentioned a lot of things are subtle in here they didn't overdo the presence of the joker and i think that's what made that scene so good absolutely absolutely they um it's easy for a character like that to overshadow a story right but the story wasn't about him he was a part of it yes but i think they were wise to not let him dominate because it's so easy for him to dominate absolutely so what was your other favorite moment in this the courtroom scene where harvey dent becomes two-faced yes uh i knew it was coming I knew it was coming. I didn't know when. And it reminded me of the scene in The Dark Knight where early on in the movie where Harvey Dent is interrogating or questioning uh, a, a witness on the stand and the witness pulls out a gun and he shoots it and it, it doesn't go off. Right. I, As I'm starting to read the scene, um, or read this portion of the chapter, I had a feeling it was going to happen and it 
knowing did not make it any better because it's what happens to Harvey Dent in this book. It's it's sort of Walter Whiteish, right? Because he starts off as like the noble white knight of Gotham, yeah. Like the, the the do good prosecutor who is genuinely making the city a better place, and you see him slowly turn um, as he becomes more powerful. Uh, what's the the expression? Uh, power corrupts, and I, I think Harvey uh, is the embodiment of this as the book goes on. Yeah, I I definitely agree with that. When he finally becomes Two Face, it's both tragic and incredibly satisfying. Yeah. And I think, you know, the fact that they took the time to s- sort of show his marital problems throughout all of this, too. It, it's like normally when we see Harvey Dent, I feel like it's either him as a prosecutor or him as Two Face. We never really get much of his personal life. And I think starting off and showing that and seeing how it was sort of devolving and then him becoming Two-Face, I think that's what made it sort of hurt even more to watch him become Two-Face. Yes, absolutely. It's uh, the way they do it, the way they show him wearing bandages immediately after. Also, yeah, if you look at the first page of chapter 12, which is Labor Day, Right. Which is our first glimpse of Harvey after the acid is thrown in his face. He's wearing like he's wearing bandages that make him look like a mummy. And what they do with what little of his face you can see with his eyes and his teeth. Yeah. It's it's pretty grotesque. Uh and I also want to give the team kudos for having a book with so many robes, the the vast majority of which are quite mainstream like the joker like scarecrow yeah Appleman, scarecrow riddler and then they throw solomon grundy in there. <laughs> yes so and uh I, I appreciate that they gave the guy a little love because uh, he doesn't get a whole lot of uh, time in the spotlight yeah definitely and I, I think you know like we mentioned with the joker not overpowering the story there are so many characters in this that easily could have been brought in and just taken over the spotlight and i know we mentioned earlier catwoman is obviously in it a lot but she's not necessarily in it the same way that poison ivy or the mad hatter or scarecrow and the joker are because catwoman at this point is sort of a constant in bruce's life so i feel like putting her in there as that constant makes sense in this story but it's not like every batman story necessarily has Catwoman right there sort of disrupting his mojo when he goes out to find the bad guys. And I think the way they brought it all together, they did it really well without making any one person stand out too much more than the other. And all of this is happening while he's still trying to figure out who Holiday is. And they never let you forget that. They never let you forget that this story is about Holiday and what Holiday is doing for basically a little over a year yeah that's correct i think the fact that this book is completely if i'm not mistaken it's entirely linear which is pretty yeah. rare in modern comics. You, you almost always have one or two flashbacks um and right. sometimes sometimes kind of needlessly so uh so the fact that this is linear really keeps you on track it's not this there's nothing distracts you uh so yes the the focus of the story is always there every page that's there needs to be yeah and it's not just the big bads that they sort of put in here they also put the crime bosses who we know they exist but they've never really been a focus in at least any of the batman books i've read so far They've sort of always just been in the background and even, you know, for anyone who is still watching Gotham like I am, you know, they're sort of just always there. And it was nice to sort of see them get a little more attention in this story because, you know, they're the ones being targeted. We have Falcone in this. We have Maroney throwing the acid in Harvey's face and 
him becoming two-faced because of that. So I think there's just so much in this story that it's like, how could you not want to read it? It's like sort of a who's who of Batman without spending too much time on any of them. Yes, I, I totally agree. Here's what, I'll say, here's what I'll say about the comic. If someone's trying to get into comics and they ask me, Max, would I love the, some of the Batman movies. Give me a graphic novel or a comic to read. I think a lot of people would go with The Killing Joke. Yeah, that was the first one I read. I love Alan Moore's writing. I think The Killing Joke is a little bit overrated. I, I would give them this because this is a smart story, but it's still easy to keep up with. You don't need any background knowledge. You, you don't have to know who Solomon Grundy is ahead of time, right. like you do with certain comics. Uh, it's very accessible and it's smart, but not overwhelming. Yeah. And I think, you know, I did start out with the killing joke and it's like, that was something that was so specific that you don't really necessarily get the kind of Batman story you're looking for with that. I enjoyed it. And I know, like you said, you think it's overrated. I know quite a few people feel that way, especially now that it's so much later after it's come out and it's sort of kind of past that hype point for it. And even starting with that, though, I was just like, okay, I want to know more about Batman. I don't need the Joker in all of these stories. And so then, you know, from the killing joke, I got into Snyder and Capullo's run because at the time that was, you know, the current run that was going on. And I think that is the one that, that sort of convinced me, okay, there's a lot more to Batman. And obviously I knew that from the movies and whatnot, but in the comic book world, there's a much bigger story here than just Batman versus the Joker. And I think, you know, between the comic books and even Batman the Animated Series, which I know people really, really enjoy, especially for an animated show, it was done so well. It's interesting to see how each creative team sort of dives into the story of Batman. And I think Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale really had something good going with this, but I feel like I've sort of said all I can possibly say about this comic. So do you have any, you know, final thoughts on this? I, I don't think so. Um, this is, uh, I actually have not read Dark Victory or Haunted Night. Right. And uh, I don't, I don't own them yet, but that's going to change soon. Because <laughs> yeah. I, and I also, I'm aware of all their Marvel work. I haven't read any of that yet, but if this is what this team has to offer, even if this is their best work. The rest is still going to be good, yeah. Yes. Like, yeah, I mean, it, it's not going to dissuade me from reading what else they have out there, because uh, this was a masterwork. Uh, this, this is pro if, if I could keep five comics five graphic novels and five trades that I've collected in the past year or so since I've gotten back into comics. Right. This has to be one of the five. I'm yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Max, for coming on to talk about this. I will definitely have to have you back on again. We can talk about more comics. Maybe we can even do, you know, a follow up with Haunted Night and Dark Victory in one episode. And like you, I am definitely going to be checking out more of this creative team because even if, like you said, this is as good as it gets, this was fantastic. So the other stuff has to at least be pretty good. So I'm looking forward to reading those and I know you are too. But like I said, thank you again for coming on today. Thanks a lot, Dana. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you to our listeners as always. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.